recording now? Yeah. Dick, have you had the message to say it's recording? Yes. Perfect. OK, well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I trust you're all doing well. Uh, welcome to yet another free webinar brought to you by SLS Select Education. Uh, we started our webinar program around three years ago now, and this is the eighth webinar we've brought to you. Uh, pleased to say it's by far our, our most popular one yet. We've uh, had, I think, just over 550 people register for today's session, which is fantastic. Um, this particular session is special. It's the first time we're having a science technician lead the webinar. Uh, we're very lucky to have Chris Pandy with us today. You can see on your screen. Um, as you may have read from his presenter bio, Chris has over 40 years experience as a science technician and as well as being involved in training other science technicians. He's also the mastermind behind the lab expert stock control system, which uh, celebrates his 20th anniversary this year. So um, we thought perfect timing to uh, to talk to Chris and collaborate to bring you this live webinar where he can share his wealth of knowledge he's built up over the years and uh, give you a nice little demo of the stock control system which he designed himself uh, talk towards the end. Um, I'm also pleased to announce uh, we have a promotion running at the moment until the end of end of March, which will be 10% off all chemicals and also 10% off Chris's stock control system software. Uh, there's no promo codes required or anything like that. So all you need to do is place orders as normal before the end of March and you'll automatically benefit from those discounted prices. Now, before I pass over to Chris to do a quick bit of housekeeping, everyone's cameras and mics have been switched off. Um, that's just to avoid any background noise or distractions while we're delivering today's content. Um, along, the, along the top of your screen, you have a few options. As I know a lot of you have found already and used, there is chat, which opens up the chat box. Uh, please use that for any comments or questions you have. Uh, we have a couple of dedicated technical support staff who will be monitoring that and answering questions. One of them you can see on your screen is the lovely Catherine Hills. <laughs> so yes, we will be trying to answer the questions we can. If, if we need to ask Chris to pause to answer some questions, we will. But there is quite a lot of content to get through today, so I don't want to throw in too many interruptions. Um, and can I please ask if you have a specific question about, let's say, chemical storage, for example, just wait until that part of the presentation is finished because your question might be answered during the presentation anyway. Um, what else need to cover? Uh, as another little tip, at the top of the screen, you have a, an option for view. Now, when Chris starts sharing his presentation, if you click on view, there's a little drop down box. It will be grayed out at the moment, but you can click on focus on content. What that would do is it will bring the presentation full screen so you can see it clearly and follow along a little bit easier. Uh, this webinar is recorded. I've already started the recording. Um, all of our webinars are recorded and loaded onto our YouTube channel. Um, they're generally available around a week after the lab event happens. So if anyone misses today's session or if you have a colleague you think would enjoy it, then roughly this time next week, they'll be able to go and find it on our YouTube channel. Uh, we will also be uh, finishing with a general Q&A session. Um, but as always, you know, if you have to run off early to do some practicals or if you think of an, a new question tomorrow which wasn't answered, the best thing to do is to contact your local area manager and um, they'll always reply, you know, as soon as they can with hopefully a satisfactory uh, answer. I really hope you will know who your local area manager is, but just in case, I'm uh, going to show you an easy way you can find out. OK, so what you're seeing here is the front page of our catalogue. This is our current catalogue. We will have a new one coming out in May. Um, the inside cover has a picture of the UK. And at the bottom, you see a picture of all of the area managers along with their telephone number, email address, and a list of all the postcode areas they cover. So as long as you know the postcode of your school, academy or college, you should be able to work out fairly easily who it is you should be contacting. Now, let me just stop sharing my screen. OK, so without further ado, I'm going to switch my camera off now, my microphone off, and I'm going to hand you over to Chris to uh, see what this enriching content he's prepared for us today. So uh, over to you, Chris. Thank you, Gary. Thank you for the intro. I'd just like to say a big thank you to Gary and uh, all the SLS team for organizing today's event. What a fantastic event. I can see 368 people 
that's uh, certainly one of the biggest uh, seminars I've done. We've done a few over COVID and the uh, forthcoming uh, years, but this is by far the best and it's all down to the SLS team. Um, as Gary said, my name is Chris um, Hamburg. I'm the Chief Science Technician here at City and Lisbon College and also the developer of the LabExpert software with some 46 years experience. So I'm going to start sharing my screen so we can start a straight into today's uh, session. Um, what I plan today to, let me just minimize that. Okay, so what we're going to discuss today is how to store and secure your current. So something that we discussed with Gary and we felt that a lot of you would gain from that and it comes with the promotion that SLS is now offering. And um, it will be a great opportunity for you at the end to ask any questions. And as, um, if you don't have the time to ask questions today, just put something in the chat and uh, the SLS team and myself we will come back to you with um, an answer to your question. OK, chemical storage. How do we store chemicals? Well, in my opinion, there are three main factors that affect the storage of chemicals. The first one is whatever regulations they are, which is I've got down as the law, location and types of stores, and chemical storage groups. So we're going to have a look in turn for each one of those. So let's have a look at the regulations, the law and regulations. And the first one, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, is the Health and Safety at Work Act of 1974. This act places the duty on the employers and employees, of course, because employees are required to sort of observe the, whatever requirements the employer has in place. Then we have the Workplace Health and Safety and Welfare Regulations of 92 which basically sets out the general requirements. So it sets the requirements with regards to ventilation, very important for us as science technicians in the prep rooms, but also things like temperature, lighting, cleanliness, and store dimensions and all those things that you can see on your screen there. So it kind of uh, puts together what the health and safety at work of 74 it's asking the employers to do, and this Act of 90, uh, Regulation of 1992, it makes more specific. Then we have the Management of Health and Safety at Work Regulation of 1999, which makes more explicit what the employers are required to do to manage health and safety. And I'm sure you all know that the main requirement on employers is to carry out risk assessments to the health and safety of their employees, but not necessarily just employees, but very often, of course, we have uh, in some premises they're called the customer, therefore the, our students will be our customers, but also we have visitors, uh, we have suppliers coming into the place, so it's the health and safety of the whole school or college. And it's very important for the uh, uh, employer to record the significant findings and to review them periodically. And it's also very important that they, they provide the employees with the relevant information and training. Now, I can say employer there, which nowadays in many of our academies, trust and so on, it's very difficult to know who the employer is. So do try and find out who you are, because if you're part of a large uh, trust, the, it could be that the employee is actually the board of governors of that trust. So it's worthwhile trying to establish who the employer is. OK, and um, another regulation is the dangerous substances and explosive atmosphere regulations. It's a mouthful that. It used to be the highly flammable liquids and petroleum regulations. And 
Again, it places the duties on the employer to protect people from the risk of their safety from fires and explosions and similar events as it is the dangerous substances regulation. But then let's see what are dangerous substances. And us as technicians, and especially the chemists like myself, well, we think, OK, what are dangerous substances? And we straight away we think of chemicals. Yes, it does include chemicals, but it's not just chemicals. It's anything that can cause harm to people as a result of fire, explosion, which will involve things like chemicals, flammable chemicals, flammable gases, various solvents, but also things that you will find in other places of the school. For example, in the art department, they may keep paints and varnishes. So they are covered by the regulation. Also, what's covered it is, is things like um, dust. So that's covered by the regulations and dust produced by various machines or various activities. So what does the DSR specifically require? So it requires the employers must find out what those dangerous substances are in the workplace and what the fire and explosion risks are for those substances and put the control measures in place to either remove the risk where this is not possible to control it. And you're all familiar when we do a risk assessment, it's very rare that we can actually eliminate or remove the risk totally. So very often we put controls in, uh, controls in place to reduce the risk to what we call an acceptable level. So the employer then needs to put those control measures in place, prepare plans and procedures to do with accidents and incidents. And I'm sure your asset department, you will have your science department, health and safety and code of practice. So where you're informed what, how you deal with accidents or incidents, because incidents are quite as important as accidents are, because it, you know it could be a mere miss, and if you don't report that mere uh, the near mix, it could happen again. So it's always good practice to report any incidents, mere misses, so we can take the appropriate measures to make sure that does not happen again. The employee also has to make sure the employees are properly informed and trained with the risk from dangerous substances. And they are also obliged to identify and classify areas of the work of the workplace where explosive advances might occur. Avoid ignition sources from unprotected equipment, for example, in those areas. So only a few more of this regulation. The Petroleum Act doesn't specifically apply to, to science departments, but it does apply to the whole school. Um, schools with very large grounds, they may have loans and the premises staff, we may have loan mowers and those that may be petrol or diesel driven and they have some petroleum spirits and therefore they have to be stored um, correctly and not exceed the 15 litres limit. Now, gas cylinders comes under the, those regulations. I'm sure many of you will have some gas cylinders. Normally in schools and colleges, we have the uh, three basic uh, cylinders, oxygen, hydrogen, carbon dioxide, other, I don't know if any of you got any nitrogen, not very useful in schools nowadays. The other main three uh, cylinders that a school will have. And if a school only have a single cylinder, which is kept ready for use, it's a term that is commonly used, ready for use, which it means 
he has the regulator attached to the cylinder. If we, in this case, so if we have a cylinder, one, two or three cylinders, the ones I mentioned before, with the regulator already attached, we can actually store those cylinders safely in a lab on a proprium as long as they are stored correctly, i.e. in a um, proper gas cylinder trolley or on a clamp. It's important to know that cylinders should not be kept in any store where we store flammable liquids. For example, if you go to a chemical store, which we'll cover in a very shortly, that you store your flammable liquids, you should never store your gas cylinders in the store. The other regulation is the manual handling regulations, which it kind of restricts the locality of chemical stores. And if the, you know, um, if the movement of chemicals would present a hazard to your team health and safety, and therefore the um, employer must provide appropriate manual handling uh, training. How do we handle and how we do transport um, chemicals? Okay, that covers mainly the uh, regulations and if you have any concerns do put them in the chat or we can ask at the end now uh, hi chris just yes. a quick question is uh, can you store cylinders together in one place like oxygen and hydrogen do they have to be separated or can they be stored in the same place no they can store in the same prep room obviously i wouldn't store them right next to each other try and keep them uh, uh, as far as possible um but yes they can be stored because you wouldn't use them, uh, sure. you know, the, the, um, at the same time. So you is stored in the prep room or in the lab, on a uh, trolley or in a sort of um, uh, against a bench, uh, fastened with the uh, uh, proper uh, cylinder clamp. Uh, but that's storing it. When you use yeah. it, you'll probably sort of you know, take it into another room or another lab where you will use it. Sure, and it doesn't matter if in the same room as the flammable's cupboard, as long as they're not inside the cupboard. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Well, if Perfect. you if you have a prep room, and within that prep room you have a separate chemical store that is lockable, then you can store them in the prep room, but Thank not in the chemical store. Any others? Uh, one last one. I'll let you carry on. Um, is carbon dioxide considered the same way as flammables? Does it have to be kept separately or is that one not a problem? The, the thing is, that obviously cylinders, are the, they're not only flammables, but they are compressed gases and therefore we treat them in the same way. OK, one, one last one, I will let you carry on. Is it OK to store but butane gas cylinders at school? Right, the, the, we are talking here about the small the butane gas cylinders uh, for using with Bunsen burners, yes, but then you have to sort of uh, store them in uh, in a flat of cabinet. And I will recommend that you take advice from Cleves, and I know that Cleves have a guide on how to store butane uh, canisters. Uh, and that is a big issue nowadays, because I, I, I have come across of, uh, some new builds where um, they don't install gas in the labs and then, uh, you know, they realise that they can't do much practical work in chemistry or biology and therefore they, um, we need to provide some source of ignition and, uh, you know, the other alternatives to use the butane cylinders, which I wouldn't recommend really, but yeah, there is no other alternative in some cases. But everything is fine if it's do a risk assessment, and take the uh, correct procedures. Would um would cylinders have to be checked yearly by someone to make sure they're they're still good or? Yes, I would recommend that the cylinders are regularly checked. It's like you'll have in your prep room your weekly um, checklist, your monthly and your termly and your annual checklist. I will have something like that in place and make sure that you do check them. Now, what I haven't mentioned in the um, 
uh, which I was trying, to, I will mention now rather than later, uh, because I might forget, is that the regulators have a date stamp, which is actually stamped on them, and they have an ex normally an expiry date of five years. So that's why the cost of the cylinder sometimes it builds up because it's not just the rental, it's um, it's also the replacement of the regulators because you've got to get a new one every five years. And nowadays, BOC does not actually um, service them, they dispose of them. So every five years we have to buy a new regulator. Thank you very much. Now you carry on now. <laughs> Okay, thank you. That's the time is going. So, location and types of stores. So, how chemicals are stored to a, a large extent will depend on the layout of the school. I can't sort of first sit here and say, right, this is where your store should be, and this is how um, how big it should be, and it will be this size and this shape, because very often it will depend on the layout of the school. Some science departments are one floor, others are on split floors, others may be on split sites. So it will depend on the layout of the school. Um, but new designs should have a central store within or I guess in the prep room. But as I said, in ex existing buildings, it's very often a case of compromise with what we have. Very often we're given a sort of little you know, a cleaner's cupboard in a corner somewhere to store our chemicals. So we really need to sort of uh, comp compromise a little bit. But if we take the steps we um, that will follow, then we'll make that storage of the chemicals uh, uh, safer. So I think there are four different types of store that we can talk about today. We have the internal chemical store, which I just mentioned. And I'm sure many of you have external stores. The prep room is always a store, regardless to if we store the majority of chemicals or just the uh, everyday use chemicals. And some schools and colleges may not have other space and no option but to store some chemicals in the lab. So let's have a look first at the internal chemical store. So an inter internal chemical store within the prep room with a fire resistance uh, uh, door of at least 30 minutes will accommodate all groups of chemicals except gas cylinders, which I have just mentioned, because they can't be stored with the uh, flammable liquids, and the same with the radioactive uh, stock that you may have. Radioactive sources should not be stored with flammables. And we will look at radioactive sources uh, later. So highly flammable liquids can be stored in flammable cabinets, but there is a limit for internal stores of 50 litres. Um, external chemical stores, I just kind of got some advantages, disadvantages. I don't think nowadays there are many advantages. Um, the main advantage is that li uh, flammable liquids are stored away from the main building. Um, you can store large quantities, but is that uh, advisable nowadays? I wouldn't because I can phone Gary and he can send me whatever I need for next day delivery nowadays or within a few days. So I will say keep your stock of chemicals to the minimum that you require. And enables bulk buying. Nowadays, actually, you're paying more to, to, to buy large quantities than to, you know, to, to buy smaller quantities. For example, if you're buying a Winchester of con acid, uh, you have a surcharge. Uh, where if you buy six one litre bottles, you don't have a surcharge. So I don't think bulk buying is uh, nowadays um, necessary. The other advantage is that they are cheaper to provide. But there are many disadvantages. Access to chemicals is so inconvenient and it's less safe. And eventually it's what um, it leads to what I sort of call um, an official internal store. What I mean with that, uh, you go out into your external store, you bring a bottle of um, the flammable liquid, so it's uh, propanone, acetone, and you use whatever you use, and you're about to take it down. A uh, teacher comes in with a late requisition, you start doing that requisition, and then that uh, you forget that that uh, bottle of um, Acetone, it's, it's in your prep room, and that's what I mean by that. Now, 
One of the most important disadvantages of external stores is actually they are, they are affected by the weather conditions. Pressure builds up in the summer. Prison uh, <clears throat> weather in winter time, they can freeze and the uh, containers get deteriorated, which will mean the label sometimes will fall off or will become unreadable. And what we're going to do with um, the bottle of chemical without a label, we can't do anything with it. I wouldn't even dare try to open it. We just have to uh, pay someone to dispose of it. And the last thing is that the stock examined less frequently, um, leading to deterioration and possible hazards I mentioned above. And we also have the uh, uh, prospect of vandalism there if the students do find out what's stored in that external store. So not great nowadays, but very often useful if you haven't got a large uh, enough uh, internal chemical store. Let's move on now onto the prep room as a chemical store. And as I said there earlier, Inevitably, every problem we use as a chem store where it's storing the majority of your chemicals because I visited many schools and they have not got a, a separate chemical store. Therefore, they need to store their chemicals in a prep room. And you can see that far is actually one I have taken personally. Those, there are two shelves, and I don't know if you, I'm sure you can read the one says arsenic trioxide mercury uh, nitrate and uh, i think there is one on the top shelf it says uranium and i didn't sort of try to sort of move the other bottle to say what kind of uranium was there so it's the kind of things you will find in schools uh, and colleges prep rooms and stores so be aware so the prep rooms are store Now, the prep room is usually the place of raw for one or more technicians, and therefore we need to sort of separate the working area from the storage section. And the main consideration we need to uh, take, and I can't emphasize this enough, is the size and available space that you have in your prep room, ventilation, and security. Who has access to the prep room that you store your chemicals? Do the teacher send a student in for, you know, asking for materials and equipment? Do teaching staff have access to the prep room? So we need to consider all those things. Laboratory is a store. Laboratory should not be used nowadays to store chemicals, but sometimes it's unavoidable. And if you are storing any chemicals, regardless to if they are prepared solutions, or you decide to store some chemicals because you don't know space elsewhere, you really need to, or the head of department, need to do a risk assessment. I know people, when I say this, they, you can't store safely some chemicals in the lab if you've got no other alternative. That's your last uh, result. You can do a risk assessment and you can safely store some inorganic or some basic organic chemicals, for example, some, you know, um, sucrose, agar, you know, all those kind of fairly safe chemicals in a cupboard in the lab. What I wouldn't do is put a label on the door to advertise what's in there, but you as a technician, the teacher should know what's stored in the, um, in the lab. Just to uh, interrupt for a second, um, a few people have been asking a question about chemical removal and having bottles with labels that are damaged and can't be read. 
Um, I know this is something you can get taken away. Cleeps may be able to do it for you, but they'll be using an outside company. I think they use Chemgo, but there are other companies like um, All Waste Matters and others. You can get them taken away. They'll have to test them first and it will be quite expensive. Yes, okay. what, what I will say, if you've got something that you're not sure about, if you're a member of Cleops, do contact Cleops. They will give you some advice. Cleops will not recommend any supplier, but I know Chemco, it's, um, it's, it, it, uh, Peter, it's been around for many years, as far as I remember, and, you know, um, really positive um, feedback from everyone that has used Chemco, and I have used them in the past, so yeah. Um, anything else before I move over to chemical story comments? Uh, one second, there's quite a few messages, it's hard to keep up at the moment. Yeah, I know, I understand. Well, my prep room is a prep storeroom and has no ventilation. Okay, no, there's nothing you can do about that, Chris. <laughs> well, that's something for the, that's something for the site manager. <laughs> no, what I will say, you need to act on that, and if you need the uh, clear support i'm sure if you contact them they'll be able to write and then you can take the written uh letter to your health and safety officer or to your head of school to to try and get and do something about it okay so you can carry on now i have got an answer to kate's question about the hydrocarbons but um, i'm not going to paste it into the chat because it will take up too much space so yeah i'll email you that kate yeah and I'm happy to have the emails um, and uh, I'll put my email address at the end and I'm happy to sort of answer any individual questions that you may have at the end. OK, let's move on because I'm where we are we doing well. Half an hour, we, we, we're on time. OK, now let's get to some more interesting chemical store requirements. OK, what we should have in our chemical store? Good security with a door able to unlock from the inside and perfectly opening out doors with the vision panel. Now, the first part, being able to unlock from the inside. You don't want to get stuck in your chem store. Really important. So make sure um, that uh, you can open the chem store from the inside. Door opening perfectly outwards. Not many, and we have a fairly good chem store here, and we haven't got a door that opens outwards. Not many builders actually do that, but if you request, they will do it. The reason for that is because it's much easier in case of an emergency to push and get out rather than having to pull, especially if you have dropped a bottle of flammable liquid or a corrosive substance, you can just go around it and push the door and get out. Where if you have to sort of go around it and try to pull the door, it, it just uh, makes it a little bit more easy. Now, ventilation. We talked a lot about ventilation. Um, should norm normally be forced extraction, but regardless of if it's forced extraction or natural ventilation, which is all depends on the location of your chem store, it needs to be cable of two air changes per hour, and that's part of the uh, built-in bulletin one on one. So a minimum of two air changes per hour. Good lighting reduces possible errors, and any sort of uh, light fittings should be frame, uh, flame proof, or if not uh, in an older builder, then the switcher should be on the outside to reduce the risk of any sparks. Floor, sloping away from the door, made from concrete, quarry tiles, or continuous vinyl flooring with the uh, sealed edges. No drain in the floor, that will allow any hazards of chemicals to enter the drain systems. And if you believe it, some I'm trying to think back in when did I start? 1977? Does that make it 46 years ago? Makes me old, doesn't it? Um, we used to have drain holes in the, in our chem stores and we used to flush down uh, with water and spillages. 
And nowadays, this is a no-no because the water boards do not allow any chemicals uh, to go down the drains. So no drain holes. And the first thing I mentioned is that the floor sloping away from the door is that to, if there is a spill, then we contain the spill in our chemist store, especially if that chemist store is not within your prep room, as in a, and it's in a corridor, for example. We don't want any spills to sort of uh, leak from the store. So we always try to contain spills. So it's containment, neutralizing, and then clearing up. So, what are the requirements? I quite like shorts in the store. I'm quite sure it's going around all the, um, the, the perimeter of the, uh, of the store. I like shorts because I can see the chemicals on the shelves. I can see the condition of the bottles. I can see if any labels are falling or about to fall off, and then I can sort of stick them back on. Um, and we come, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, shelves in, the, in a minute or so. Running water might be helpful in emergencies, but it's not necessary. Spill kit. Uh, I'm sure SLS probably says some spill kits. Uh, sorry, Gary, but you can actually make much cheaper uh, spill kits uh, uh, by yourselves. Follow the clear instructions. It's normally with some cut liter, citric acid, sodium bicarbonate, glass bags, that kind of thing. You can have your own spill kit and you can have a small spill kit for the lab, separate one for the prep and a bigger one for the um, chem store. All the information on clears, fantastic information on there. The other thing that we should not have in um, Chemical store is voids or four cylinders. Many new builds, they got partition walls. And very often when the partition goes up to the ceiling, they, 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 I don't know why they do that, but there's some builders, they leave a little gap, which we call the void. Make sure that your chemical store hasn't got a void, um, because then any fumes, um, will spread out from the chemical store to the other rooms. Now, no radiators or heating pipes. Chem store should be a very basic room. Uh, with, as I said, the floor should be, you know, nothing fancy. Concrete floor is absolutely fine if it's sealed uh, or a liner uh, floor. Um, and no heating. We need to keep our chem stores fairly um, cool. Make a stop there. Have we got any questions, Gary? Uh, we've had quite a few. I mean, some have been answered by other people on the uh, chat. Um, I'll give you one question. Does the internal chemical store within a prep room have to have a fire door? Yes. That's OK. That's perfect. Um, Someone has a vision panel on their chemical store. I don't think that's a necessity. That's just a nice addition, is it's it? It's advisory. Or? Look, it depends where your chemist store. If your chemist store is, is is within the prep room, it will be nice to see you, your chemicals there. But if your chemist store was in a corridor, for example, I wouldn't um, have a, um, a vision panel to advertise what's in there. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a fair point. Um, someone said about the extraction fan being left over the school holidays. That's a definite yes, I'd imagine, for chemical yes. stores. Uh, nowadays, uh, fan, well, the extractor fan should be 24 hours, really. Uh, nowadays, the technology has moved on and we've got fans that, uh, you know, they can be left on permanently. Um, so, yes, do leave your fans on. It depends on what kind of an extraction fan you have. Uh, but if you have one that is on a timer, make sure you put it on before you go into your chemical store. If it's um, you know if it's not on time, that kind of thing. But make sure you have good ventilation in your chemical stores. Um, if a chemical store is in the prep room and has its own ventilation, do the requirements also apply to the prep room about ventilation, or is it just a chemical store? 
Well, I, I would say you need ventilation for your prep, a separate uh, vent for your prep room because the ventilation is to for your chem store that's separate for that chem store to uh, replenish the air. It's not just a matter of taking out air because if you remember the slide, it said air changes. What we mean with air changes, we want fresh air to go in there to replenish that air that's been taken out. And that's for the chem store. You also, you're in your prep room, you're making solutions, you're preparing things, and you also when, you know, um, you may have a prep, um, uh, a film cover, for example, um, but I would recommend if you haven't got a window for um, that you can open for natural ventilation, then um, uh, an extractor is advisable. But if you have a window, you have a film cupboard, so you've got your film cupboard where you open all your chemicals in, where you make all your preparations, and then you can open a window for some natural ventilation, then I will say that's sufficient. You don't need the extra uh, mechanical ventilation there. Perfect. Um, if a chemical store has electrical boxes or trip switches above the flammable cupboard and plus sockets in the chemical store, is that OK or is that against regulations? Uh, I wouldn't say it's OK. That I mm. wouldn't have that room as a, it shouldn't be a chem store if you got all your electrical services yes, in there. In the very least, it's a bad start, we'll say that. Yes. <laughs> um, is there an ideal temperature for a chem store? Um, I would say just um, between 18 and 20 is the ideal temperature for a chem store, nice and cool. I wouldn't have a store, you know, um, a chem store or anything above 20 degrees. Yeah, I suppose there's, there's no real advice about keeping them cool, is there? It's just... Uh... People no, it's just cool. a matter of having them. Yeah, when I say cool, we're not going to sort of mm. start uh, cooling them down, either yeah, it's just, or air conditioning there or at all. It's just that. So um, just make sure we don't radiator, want so it's switched We off. don't want it to be warm in there. We don't want it to be hot. We, that's why we don't have any radiators in the, in a store. Okay, we've got a few people saying uh, their chemicals meet none of these requirements. Um, so as someone who visits a lot of schools and chemical departments, you are not alone, I'll tell you that. But um, it's something you probably should raise with the site manager, whether it's something they would be able to fix or not, or, or would get round to fixing. Uh, depends on where you are, I guess. Well, and you, and you can make a start and you can go to your manager and say, look, I've just been to a, uh, you know, into a webinar or a seminar or attended a course. And this is what they're recommending for our chem stores, and ours is not sufficient. And then, uh, you know, take, you know, if you don't do it, nobody will do it. And therefore, you should take the initiative and try and um, make those changes. I think, in the very least, you're right. If you just bring it to someone's attention and you've done your job, you know, you, you've pointed out something which you think needs to be fixed, and uh, it's not your job to fix it yourself. That's right. Um, a few people are wondering who should hold the keys to the chemical store. Um, obviously, it, it will be a local um, decision there. It will normally be the senior technician, but it's very difficult to sort of. I wouldn't so I wouldn't give keys to. It, it will be the the um, senior technician, but uh, then if what happens if that senior technician or technician is not there? So then it, maybe you, you need to have a key cabinet where you have all your keys for the different areas. So yeah, that, think, that would be a longer decision, I would say. Yeah, I and mean, I think, like you said, you'd have to have a key somewhere in the school. You don't want to take it home and lose it or only have one. Um, Absolutely, but I wouldn't but, go giving, uh, it wouldn't be on a master that every teacher has got access yeah. to the camp store. And again, I've been to a few schools that do have that and uh, it's not ideal. Yeah. We've had a lot of questions flying. I'm just trying to scroll through them. Uh, what our chemical store? From okay, so you carry on, Chris. I'll try and okay. filter through these and maybe yeah. come back. All right, let's now move to the um, um, how we store chemicals, the uh, chemical storage groups. So different chemicals have different storage requirements, and therefore we divide the chemicals into groups. Chemicals with each group can be stored together, then different groups can be kept up, um, apart within that chemical store. And the storage groups, which I used and uh, we used in the, 
or Lab Express uh, software, and is the ones used by CLIPS and the ADSC that have been accepted by the Health and Safety Executive. And therefore, if you have something that has been accepted by the Health and Safety Executive, why not uh, go with that? But I have been to some schools where they use a slightly different system. And um, regardless to which system that you use, you have to make sure that all your technicians and teachers are very familiar. Now, the CLIPS storage system, um, it categorizes the chemicals to the different groups. For example, we have general chemicals and general inorganics are given the code GIN. Organics are G-O-R-G, oxidizing OX. I'm sure you've all seen this before. Then we have the corrosive substances, which are the corrosive liquid acid and non-acid, corrosive solids, water reactive. Then we have flammables, flammable solid, flammable liquid, water reactive, all those. Then we have T for toxic chemicals, what they used to be called the poisonous. Enzymes, it's a code cold, it means stored in a refrigerator. And then we have what I call the nasty special cases, things like bromine, silicon tetrachloride, the radioactive sources, and phosphorus, which we don't find very often in schools nowadays. This is a typical, again, what I mentioned at the beginning, this is just an example, because the shape and size will be different in, in, in every school. But if we assume this is a chem store with shelving going all the way around, I will store the inorganic chemicals on this side, the organics on that side. In the middle here, I will have my flammable uh, cabinets, a couple of flammable cabinets for my flammable liquids. Here I have a flammable cabinet for my water reactives. And then um, in a corner there, I'll have some containers for my special case chemicals. Now, this being assuming it's a lockable chem store within or adjacent to the prep room, I can store with the inorganics, some of the toxic chemicals and corrosive solids. But make sure that you segregate from the organics and oxidizing, and especially oxidizing agents can go with the inorganics and make sure they're all apart from the organics. I'm sure you all have seen the uh, activity with potassium permanganate, which is an oxidizer. And then you use some glycerol. Uh, you pull that on top, uh, which is a general uh, organic, and just after a minute or two, ignites. So that's why we tend to keep, we must keep oxidizing away from our organic chemicals. So, and this is what I'm talking about. We have shelves going all the way around. So we start with the top shelf that it should be about an eye level. And very often uh, when I say this to people, they say, well, you know, he's tall, I'm short, or the other way around. What do you mean, what's an eye level? It's somewhere where you can actually pick up a chemical without having to use a stool or a chair or something to to climb to pick up a bottle of chemical if you do because there is no other option and therefore you only got a, a very small chemical store and you have to have um shows higher up then use proper safety steps that you can actually safely climb and pick up those uh, chemicals but i will say i love it and we have narrow shelves at the top. And as we go down, we have some wider shelves. And some shelves at the bottoms come further apart where we can store some of the larger um, containers. 
you know, I'm sure you're buying sodium bicarbonate or sodium chloride in three kilogram taps because it's more economical rather than the standard 100 to 50, 500 ml bottles for the other solid chemicals. Acids, I passionately hate acid cabinets. They will corrode in no time. You put all your acids together where you should keep them apart and you go and open the door and then all the fumes hit you in the face. You put your acids on the floor, in trays, a tray for this acid, and depending on the space that you have, as far apart from each one as possible. And I cannot put a little one. Not there spot any deliberate mistakes. I'm sure you're going to tell me there are far too many bottles in there. But let's see first of all. So this is the uh, um, uh, a, a snapshot of the uh, narrow shelves at the top and wider shelves at the bottom. And this is what I meant with the acids. There were far too many bottles in there. You need to sort of spread them all out. So, appropriate size of tray for the number of bottles. You could use shallow trays. I prefer to use deep trays, but give me, let me give you an example. If I was going to use a deep tray here, if I try and lift that bottle out, I haven't got sufficient space to lift it up. That means I have to tilt it, and I really don't like tilting the, that bottle. So, I'd rather use a shallow tray where I can lift it up and out. But if you have sufficient space, do use uh, a deep tray. But if you minimize the number of bottles in each tray, even if there is a leak, and it's very unusual that all bottles are going to leak at the same time, you're containing the spill. Now, I, as you can see, I haven't got any absorbing materials in my trays. I don't like... Um, you will find uh, in many places they recommend putting some absorbing material there will absorb any spills. I just find that the bottles don't sit straight on the in the tray, and therefore um, I don't like to put uh, absorbing material in there. Now I kind of said I, I like my um, acids on the floor, which I kind of lied a little bit, but I prefer to have them in a little plinth, raise it all up. Here is a plinth I had our facilities people uh, built for me, but it could, you could use some bricks or some slabs or anything. The um, I know this is not, it's not um, in person, so I can't explain, but it stops you kicking the tray because if it's on the floor, you go into your chem store, you can possibly kick that tray with the acids. Having it raised up a little bit stops uh, that from happening. Um, since, sorry, since you're speaking about acids, um, a couple of people are interested in, should you have, uh, I'm going to try and get back to the question now. <laughs> uh, do you need absorbent in the trays that you're keeping the acids? Yeah, this is, I, I think I, I said that. Uh, there are some people oh. that did, uh, it's a choice. I don't personally like uh, the absorbent in the, in the tray um, because then the bottles do not sit straight and it's, it's a possibility they will, uh, you know, fall down. Um, there are some people that do advise to put um, absorbent, so it's a matter of choice there. Very rarely we have spills and you have the container there that it's, uh, it will, uh, you know, so if there is a spill, it's contained. Thank you. Um, is that okay to keep bromine in the same place as conch acids? Yes, and the next one, actually, the next slide, no, I missed that. So, thank you. Thank you for mentioning that, because I forgot to mention those special cases. I did say where we put the special cases, and bromine is a nasty fuming, chemical. So how do we store bromine? Bromine normally comes in a glass jar inside the metal container with some absorbing material. And I will leave it with us 
is in those two containers. Then I will put that in a tray. So I will put in a grapnel stick tray, put some sodium, a container of sodium carbonate in there, and some sodium thiosulfate. In case the sodium carbonate, it will neutralize the bromine, and the sodium thiosulfate, it will, you can put it on if you get any bromine onto, onto your skin, so you can neutralize with that. So when I use the bromine, I take the whole tray with the sodium carbonate, the thiosulfate, and the bromine, and then I put it in the fume cupboard, and that's where I open the bromine in the fume cupboard. Then take the whole thing and put it back into the store. Okay, any others? Um, I say keep going for now. I'm trying to keep, okay, keep track of things. That's fine. Um, Right, let me see if uh, there's anything else I've got. Again, we have the uh, flammable water reactors. You are lithium, your sodium, your potassium in a metal cup in there. Uh, and again, this um, um, substance, again, uh, they do come in a glass jar inside uh, an aluminium container or a metal container. We'll keep them in there. I know in the past um, you have some metal containers to put them inside. Um, uh, that we, you know, I was lucky because I'm so old. Uh, I've been around for so many years. I got this container that was is lined with um, uh, a sort of uh, fire resistant material, and it's divided into different containers. And then I have my sodium, my lithium, potassium in one box, and then I can take the, the whole thing out, which is quite nice. But if you haven't got that. A nice, uh, good, just, uh, strong biscuit tin, and uh, put them inside that, and then that's inside a proper uh, um, flammable cabinet. <clears throat> okay, so we talked about so the acid, as I mentioned before, in the trays. So I have one tray with hydrochloric acid another with sulfuric, the other with the nitric, and all the other acids that you have, and have them as uh, label and as far as um, possible from each other. So, the next slide you've got, here is, um, it, that's actually the chem store up in York. The uh, National Science Learning Centre up in York, very similar to, to my chem store. I mean, uh, I'm not going to make any comments. I think there are far too many chemicals in there. Um, if um, I would space them out a little bit, but as you can see, it uses the same uh, method of storing uh, chemicals. Now, I normally talk about the hazard symbols. And I've got here on my slides, as you can see, the new COP regulation. I was thinking the other day, I've been doing this for uh, a long time because they're not that new anymore. It was in 2008 when the European Parliament decided to sort of uh, <clears throat> have a globally harmonized system for the classification and labeling. So, this was the time scale, it was surprising. So we started back in 2009, 2010, where we had the new um, COP regulation of substance, and then we moved on to the mixtures, and then became compulsory in 2015. So it's been a while now. And of course, the you're, we're going to come to the pictograms, but they also change the, um, the wording. Well, before we have preparation is now a mixture. We have the symbols is now the, uh, the globally harmonized uh, pictogram, the risk phrases, and now hazard phrases and S and P. So I'm sure you're all familiar because they've been around for a while now. And the nine pictograms, which they're very similar to the other ones uh, there here. And I kind of, uh, this is what, you know, compared to the old one, we did have an explosive uh, hazard symbol before, and now we have the explosive pictogram. 
and then uh, they kind of simplify where we have flammable um, and flammable plus is now just one flammable oxidizing. This is a new one. We didn't have one for compressed gases before, liquefied gases and dissolved gases. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, yeah, so then the corrosives, uh, corrosive to maximum skin, severe eye damage, the one that kind of, again, we used to have toxic acute toxicity, uh, it's now it's just uh, all those three uh, replaced with one, and then we have the irritant and the harmful, and now we have the health hazard. Now, some of these names may change a little bit because, funny enough, the uh, they never given them proper names. They actually given them numbers. This is a new one, which I call chronic health hazard. So basically what they say, these chemicals that will um, be hazardous to respiratory uh, system, carcinogenicity, or talking any organs, um, is what I would call a chronic health hazard. And some of those are the toxic chemicals of the poisonous and some harmful chemicals now in this category. And then this is hazardous to the aquatic environment, which is roughly the same as before. And then the uh, statements. And then it's the new label. We, we are all familiar with it because we've been using it since 2009, 2010. The real lot of information, I quite like the new labels because you can make your risk assessment from this label here. Uh, the only difficulty is, is that sometimes the label is so big they can't fit it on the bottles and uh, they use larger bottles for small quantities of uh, chemicals. Now, all this information, I put them, you can take a snapshot with your phone and have those um, pages, but uh, I'm sure Gary said that the recording will be available. So you can go to the uh, web pages. That will be the uh, European Chemical Agency website, where you have all the information there. And then understanding your CLP, understanding the labels. I quite like this one. And then, oops, and then there's a lovely quiz that you can actually, um, if you go onto that page, you can actually, I quite like this. I um, I did a quiz the, the other day, I was glad I passed. I got everything right. But it's quite nice, you can use this little uh, quiz. So lots of information there. Uh, so um, good websites. Uh, there was there was loads of information there. Um, yeah. I think a couple of people joined late. We have covered secure your chemicals. Um, as Chris has mentioned, this webinar is recorded and it should be available within a week on our YouTube channel. Um, everyone who's here is going to get an email from their local area rep as well. Um, so we'll probably wait till the link is ready for YouTube. So we'll send that along with the hydrocarbons list and anything else we think might have been useful from today. We've had a lot of requests about your presentation, Chris. People would like a copy. I've already messaged yes. to say they wouldn't get it as a uh, as a slideshow, but possibly a PDF format. Yes, um, I have printed as a PDF. I'm not quite sure if I emailed it to you, Gary, but uh, I will do that straight after this uh, session. I only uh, have it as a slideshow, but I know you've worked very hard on it, so um, I think we'll share it as a PDF for those who, yeah. who, who need it's it. It's much easier. It's a large document with all the images and all the links I have in there, and therefore it has to be a PDF. 
Um, I'm also sure I'll say because there is uh, just under 400 people on here today. I've tried to keep up with the questions and bring them to Chris. I'm, I'm sure I've missed a few here and there. But um, like I said, when we have a general Q&A session at the end of this, so you can always ask the question again. But if not, then email your area manager and they'll get back to you. Um, if we don't know the question, we go to our technical support staff like Dodder and Cat. And if we get really stuck, I call people like Chris, who just know a lot more than me. So uh, we will find you an answer one way or the other. Um, if that's in your presentation, should I quickly chat about the EPP, Chris? Is it a good time for that? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you can yeah. go for it. OK, if you just stop sharing your screen for a second, I'll um, just yeah. share something. Everyone. OK, hello again, everyone. So um, yeah, the EPP is the Explosives Precursor List, which um, which did come around, I think, October last year. It came into force. Um, it's a list of chemicals which you do use at the school. And as a supplier, we now require a form to be filled out and some verification. Um, I'm just going to share the form which we need. Uh, this is the form we send you. Um, at the top, you can see some of the things on the list, like ammonium nitrate, hydrochloric acid, hydrogen peroxide, nitric acid. I mean, there, there's quite a few things there you are using regularly at the school. Um, it does depend on concentration. So looking at that list, it's that concentration or above. We do require this form to be filled out. It's not very complicated. Uh, we need the name, the address, the VAT number. I mean, all schools, colleges and academies are businesses, so you should have a VAT number. Um, nature of your trade would be education. We will need a named person and we will need photographic ID of that person. Doesn't necessarily have to be the science technician. Um, it can be more or less anyone inside the school, um, but we do need that. And I mean, you don't have to send us a passport or a driving license. I think what most people do is they have a school ID badge. Um, that That's that's sufficient for us. Um, we will need a signature and a date. Um, once we keep that on file, it lasts for 18 months. And then after that, we'll need the same form filled out again. Um, it's, it's not because of us, say, it's it's, it's because it's legislation, it's something we have to do now. Um, again, what I'll do is when we you get your email sometime next week, I'll try and include this form on that email because, uh, yeah, quite often we know you guys are trying to order things last minute, you need it quickly, and the last thing you want is us to send you a form saying, fill this out first and then we'll process your order. So that is uh, just briefly a bit about EPP. Um, I mean, there is actually a, a poisons precursor list and a drugs precursor list, but um, they're not affecting you at the moment because um, you're allowed to get them without this verification. Let me just stop sharing. Uh, yes, someone's put in, they've been told only to send in staff ID. I mean, I think most people would prefer to send in staff ID. I, I mean, I'd recommend that. We're not going to do anything with your ID, we just keep it in a folder in case we're ever asked for it. Um, my guess is we'll never be asked for it, to be honest, but um, it's just a, it's a box we need to tick nowadays. Uh, um, I've seen some, I've seen people, especially on Cleeps, I think it was, they said the person who fills out the order form should be the named person. Um, from our perspective, we just need a person who is working at the school to have done the ID. So I don't think that's as big an issue. Um, at the bottom, sorry, at the bottom of the form, which I just stopped sharing. Let's put it back for a second. Yeah, down here, there are a couple of links. Um, obviously, the government link, which shows you the legislation and every a full list of everything which is included. Um, and yeah, there are some duties to the person who is uh, who is putting their name down here, and you can also find that and the bottom link there. Um, so if in doubt, like I say, just email your area manager and they'll try and get you an answer to your question. I think as long as you're the same delivery address, we just need one ID, even if you're separate departments. Um, if you are spread across two different buildings, we will probably need the form filled out twice for each different delivery address. Yep, at least you're, you're you're fine. I say as long as we have an idea of someone, it doesn't matter if we're getting it from the finance department and you're the, the named person. That's perfectly fine. Oh, someone did have a question about labeling before. Um, they're saying uh, if they have old stuff, should they be relabeling it? Chris, is there a time yes. limit? Are they going to get in trouble? <laughs> no, actually. Yeah, 
This is, I made a note because it's just, uh, you know, it's one of the things that, yes, CLIAPS now recommends to actually relabel everything within your CLP pictograms. Yeah. Yeah. So in the past, uh, some years, a few years back, they were saying have both, but now because it's been so long, they are saying relabel everything. That's the CLIAPS advice. Yeah, I mean, and Cleeps, I mean, it's been mentioned a few times in the chat. They are a good resource. If you're not a member of them already, it's not expensive yeah. to sign up and and you do get hazard cards, advice about disposal and yeah. and lots, lots, lots of other things. So, uh, yeah, if uh, if you're looking for help, then uh, Cleeps are quite a good place to go first. Yeah. Um, yeah, ID, like I say, uh, any photographic ID, I mean, it's not everything but driving license and passport are the ones used for most things school id is what i'd recommend i mean i think every school now you do have photographic id and that's perfectly fine okay um i so i'm sure i've missed a few questions here but i think uh, we're going to pass back to chris to show you this uh fantastic stock control system he's designed and, actually, and changed over yeah. the years <laughs> hey. How are we doing now? Are we? Did I miss? Did I click share there? Um, let me go back. Okay, are we? Gary, am I back onto the slides? Yes, you're in the presentation again. Okay, brilliant. Okay, what I wanted, I I know Thomas, uh, we've got about 35 minutes left, and I want to briefly. This is where we stopped before. One of the things that you'll find in the in on your chemical bottles um, is the CAS number. Uh, this is the American system. Uh, you, you know, every chemical is it has to be entered into a chemical database. And if you want to, and this is the European uh, one. Sometimes uh, companies have both. Some of them. This one here has got both the um, EU and the American system. Some of them may have the European, others may have the American. Basically, if you want exactly the same bottle that you've been using before, exactly the same chemical, by searching for the classification number, uh, you, you know that you're buying exactly the same chemical. Um, now, this is something that we done during COVID. I done a session on chemical, uh, what we do after a long shutdown, but I think now that is quite relevant. So I'm going to spend another five minutes going through this one before I go into the demo of our software, because I think it's quite relevant and I'm sure you'll find it useful. Is that because so many technicians are now at term time only. And if you sort of uh, take it from even in the summer break, uh, by the time you finish in July, you don't come back until September, it's a long time. And therefore, the first thing you need to do you shouldn't be alone when you check in the chem store for the first time back. In case there are any spillage, fumes, or other hazards, make sure it's safe to enter. You don't want to sort of rush, open the door, go into your chem store, and you find that there is um, a leak from something, there are fumes, and you know they, they overcome you, and then you haven't got anybody to call assistance for. So this is the reason for is that you, in case of emergency, you have somebody else there to support you. Now, what to check? Check your ventilation is still working. Look out for any leaks. The condition of your chemical bottles. That's why, uh, and missing labels. That's why um, I quite like the shelving system. I know Gratnels do the, uh, they sell the racking system for storing chemicals. I personally do not like them because you can't see your chemicals that are inside the tray. Some people say, yeah, but if there is a spill, it's inside the tray. Well, if you got everything on the shelf, you can see the condition and you take action before this the, the spill happens. So look out for missing labels. Look out for any extensive correction meta services because then the, that's a sign that something is wrong. So use your chemical stock list to check the quantities of chemicals or else you left them. Because there are bound to be some other people that have got access to the chemistry, all these the facilities people. We have some access, but make sure that yeah, you do 
a stock list. And then the condition of the stool. Hydrochloric acid, concentrate hydrochloric acid, once the pores are open, it gives off hydrogen chloride gas. And these can leak out to the stool and accelerate metal corrosion that you can see there, but also you get the, um, the white flash that everybody comments on there. And why is that? Because very often we don't tighten up the bottles. And what kind of pots do you use to store your congas is quite important. I know many people, they use dropping bottles and things like that. Um, I quite like now using the um, um, Fisher brand oh, no. uh, bottles. Uh, the now the, the smaller ones available, 50 million ones available, which are quite good, but that's your choice how you do it. So the hydrogen chloride gas reacts with the ammonia and the and amines that you may have in your chem store, and you get the production of the uh, white powder, which is the chloride salt, and deposits on this bottles and you know, white fluffy flies around in your chem store. You don't want to be breathing that stuff in. So it, you know, make sure. Your bowls, uh, bowl tops are uh, tight. The also thing that you need to check out some of your organic bottles. You can see they start after a bit of time. Um, they start to sort of degrade and they start to leak. Well, take that in the fume cover and replace the top. You don't even have to replace the bottle, replace the top. So the other things that you need to look out for now. That reminds me, I haven't actually mentioned the regard to uh, stores. Um, so store your, uh, check your radioactive sources. And how we store radioactive sources, which I did say I was going to mention, I forgot to do it, is that if you do have radioactive sources, the first thing you need to do, download a copy of L93, the clear sky, L93, study that document, and then you will know how to store those chemical uh, radioactive sources. It gives full information. Know how to store them, but also what to buy and what you shouldn't buy, what you should have and what you shouldn't have, or, and how to sort of use it. Everything is in there. I can't recommend it enough. But basically, radioactive sources should be stored in an in a room, but nobody uh, that's two meters away from where someone sits there all the time. And there should be a cabinet inside. Uh, it should be sorry, there should be in a radioactive cabinet that is inside another cupboard. But rather than me trying to explain these, please go to the experts, clips have all the information that you will need and the guide is L93. And I think uh, there is an update or if, if it hasn't come out yet, there will be an update pretty soon. Okay, so we are coming to the last half an hour and I just wanted to talk a little bit about the lab experts stock control software, which we have for chemicals and equipment. I'm going to concentrate mostly on the chemicals today. If I have time, I'll run through the, the, the equipment. But the chemicals. Sorry, Chris. Yeah. Can I have one quick question about radioactive sources? Um, yes. Do they need to register them? So that, as in, yes. they've got them, at, they do. That's they okay. do. Yes. Perfect. They go. need on to be registered. That's why, as rather than me trying to, in a very short period of time, explain all the information, all the information is on L93 guide. Thank you. So, I, I designed and written the software some over 30 years ago out of uh, necessity because there was nothing um, in the market that I can actually keep track of all my chemicals. I don't think there is any other uh, system for schools and colleges to the extent um, the detail of our software. They come with 530 chemicals already preloaded, uh, pre but rather than going through and talking, okay, I'll bring up the, uh, so my contact details, which I'm sure Gary will, show, uh, will share. 
and they will be on the PDF that will send out. And uh, acknowledge Mr. Clay for the uh, uh, work they do and provide us with all the information. So I'm going to share my screen now for the uh, chemical database, and that's on the screen, Gary. Yes, it is. Great. Okay. So when you open up the software, this is the main form, and it's the form view. And as I was saying uh, earlier, it comes complete with 530 chemicals already included in here with all the data information and hazard information. So data information, uh, if you look at butanol, you will have the formula, the molecular weight, the classification number, and all the different hazards. The category codes, they are all listed, that we mentioned before, butanol is flammable. It has the CLIABS has code, and then you have a separate hyperlink that you can copy and paste it could be to the material safety data sheet. It could be to a worksheet that you use. It could be a link to the SLS website with the order code where, where you buy your that chemical. Now, the important thing, what we have done, and this is our 20 year anniversary uh, edition, which just came out um, uh, this January. And um, on top of the secure your chemical list, we included the EPP list that um, Gary has talked about. Um, so what it means, this chemical is not on any of, of, of uh, those lists. But if I search, for example, hydrogen peroxide, and it, it helps if I can spell, so hydrogen peroxide, you can see the surge, how easy the surge is. So I can see hydrogen peroxide, 100 volume, and then it's ticked. We tell you it's under the secure your chemicals list, which that's the home office secure your chemical list. It's a small number of chemicals that can be used for explosives. And it's the same with the EPP. What it means, look, take extra care of that chemical. If you're putting that in the lab, make sure it's, it comes back. So all the information is included in, in here. And by the way, this version, this our 20 year anniversary is only available for now from SLS or directly from us. It's not actually, we haven't supplied it to any of the other um, suppliers. Uh, but if you do order from any of the other suppliers, we will send the latest version anyway. So the main form, which has all the information. So basically we give each chemical an ID. And the ID is really useful because even if the label falls off the bottle, you can go and type that ID into the database. Um, I can type one, two, three and see what comes up. One, two, three is citric acid. And, and then I can go three, four, five, and then grams out in. And therefore, even if the label off the bottle and you have written with a permanent marker the bottle, then you can identify that chemical, which is saves you a lot of money of disposing. Now, our software has the uh, optional uh, functionality of the barcode. So you can put barcodes on your chemicals. I've got one example here. And I will show you how we create barcodes. And all you need to do then, let's switch back to the main form, scan the barcode, and that chemical uh, just comes up just like no, you didn't on this case because we didn't scan it. The silver nitrate, which is what I've got in front of me here, silver nitrate comes up. So the idea of the software is that because it comes with all these 530 chemicals, with all this information included, all you need to do, enter the location. So it could be a chemist store. Then when you add the chemicals, uh, just add. So if I just received another 500 grams, it tours it all up for you. When you use a chemical, 
say I'm going to use 100 grams. You put it in there, it adjusts the total. But also, what he's done here, quantity use, it tells me I have used that chemical just now and it puts today's date for you. We have a minimal stock. So when a minimal stock is reached, they will send that chemical into a report so you can reorder it. If you take to, uh, this box here, it will put today's date and you don't stock you for that chemical. You have the comments, you can put any information on there. Really simple to use. So for the first time you enter a chemical into the system, all you need to do is simple. I just pick this bottle and for the first time I'm going to enter it into my database. It's silver nitrate. I can go search for silver nitrate. There it is, 543. Therefore, I put a label 543 or I will put a barcode 543. That's done. You navigate away, it's safe. There is no even. Or you can go to data sheet view, which is great because you can sort by, uh, you know, uh, A to Z, Z to A. You can filter your chemicals that you can find. So if you can't find, you know, Slide that I did before. I start, um, I done a spelling mistake and I couldn't find this, or you're not familiar with which name you're using the chemical. Although, when you do a search, if I do acetone, it comes as propanol, and therefore, or if you do ethanoic, it will have. Uh, so it doesn't matter, but if you can't find it, you can use the data feed view. So if I can scroll down from here, so I'm A to Z, scroll all the way down, find silver nitrate, and then uh, you'll find that it's got the same ID. So another way um, for finding chemicals. Um, so we put it the uh, number. All the barcode on there. The next time you want to use it, you just went to your chemist store, you grabbed your bottle, click in the barcode search, scan the barcode, silver nitrate, can see that's how we've done before. We can add or we can use. How simple as that. Of course, you may have chemicals that are not on my 530 list. We go to new record and I can add a new chemical. I go, um, and what's useful about the data should be here is because I can sort by stock number. I'm going to do Z to A, and I know 6 to 9 now is my last stock number. So if I go to a new record here, I'm going to use 630 as my new chemical. Then I go, uh, I can go silver nitrate again. Okay. Doesn't matter because I can add another silver nitrate and say this one is um, uh, 0.1 mole solution rather than my uh, paint. I will say, say that's um, corrosive liquid uh, non acids. Yeah. So and then you just enter the rest of the information in there, as simple as that. And then, of course, here I can actually put, say, um, it the, the has the pictograms on there, so it's corrosive, and it has the two um, health hazards. And, in, and the advantage of the database, oh, that shouldn't be that, or things have changed, I can delete the and replace it, and it checks with me if I want to replace it. Now, on the form view, if I go back to butanol, clear passcode already there. There we are. The options are already. You don't have to search for it. So the clear passcode is there for you. Oh, we've done all the work for you. So it's there for you to view. Now, that's in the form view. 
and we send it at a field view, which is a table view. So really great, another way of finding coming calls. But really where the difference comes with all the other systems that are available in the market is the reports. This is what you need. On here, that's a list of all the chemicals that you have in stock. So now you can put your name of your school on here uh, in the form view, and that will be on your report, all chemicals report, location one, two, three, the total stock, the main hazard, the category, if it's on the secure, your chemicals list, and then there is an EPP uh, list, but it gives you a list of all your chemicals that you have in stock. Now, you notice that it only lists, although there are 530 chemicals, it only lists the ones that you have in stock. Chemicals by name, uh, not a very useful report to be honest, but it gives you a list of each chemical and some information that if you wanted to, to use that, something new we incorporate. But they're really useful one, chemicals by location. And what it does, it actually remembers the location, so you don't have to remember that. So all the chemicals in the front of the cupboard, here they are, they are listed, just see if there's that. Then report build, a great new feature that we have. So I'm going to select all locations, and then if I select all categories, that will be the same as my main report, the it lists all the 532 chemicals in there, or if I wanted to select all the corrosive liquid acids, it will list them there, yes, and it will show them there. Really um, useful report. You can see the ones that you have and the ones that you don't have, but then what it does is report builder, so you can build a report, or if you want for each particular store or every category, um, available. So if you wanted all the toxic chemicals, you can see which one's toxic. The other amazing report really is this chemical story order. So all the chemicals that have gone below your minimum stock, they're here for you to reorder. It saves you time. The idea behind it, if you use our system, you never run out of chemicals because you kind of um, been updating it. And I will come back to how we update in a sec. Chemicals pass their use by day. I personally don't quite agree with use by day. Okay, there are very few chemicals that have got you know, use by days, things like enzymes, things like hydrogen peroxide does go off if you don't store it correctly. But in the in the majority of cases, look, do a quick test. If it works, it's absolutely fine. We are not a research institution, but it's been asked for me for many years, so I have included it. So the uh, once they have passed and the ones within three months, so if you're in July planning for September, you can plan ahead. Another fantastic report, quantities used this academic year. So you can see which chemicals you use this year and, and uh, how much you have used here. And then we made it so easy. You can print or export this uh, report into Excel or PDF, and you can save it each year, and then you can see how much you have um, used. Then, this is the Secure Your Chemicals report, the Home Office Secure Your Chemicals, and this is the new one, which put the EPP list on here as well. And this, for our 20 year anniversary, what I've done is just been, well, it was released on the 1st of um, January. I actually put an extra tab, chemicals regulations, and so we are information about EPP. And then I have a link here so you can go to the Home Office website and get all the information about EPP that you need. So it's all there. And it's the same for, oops, share the right thing. And it's the same for secure your chemicals. I put the link there. It opens that onto the secure your chemicals uh, 
a guidance and you can see um, all the information there from the home office and it tells you the, the little guidance, good practice. And here is the list of those chemicals uh, there in that. But I said, we have done that for you so you don't have to worry about it. Okay, uh, and then the other tab is just, um, there is a user manual and my contact details. It opens up some PDFs. It tells you how to use the software, how to install it. So really easy to navigate all from this top ribbon here. So really easy to use software. Um, now the Barker search I show you, so I show you the uh, that that's for the new records. Now, if you click on that and you say I'm not going to enter the new record here now, this is what the undo record does, and it takes you back to where you were. Now, if you haven't got a chemical, you can delete it, but you can't get it back. You checked with you before, but if you haven't got it. You can delete it. I would suggest delete it. Keep the um, database to to the minimum, and then if you do get that chemical back, go to a new record and add it manually. You can do that. So it's all you know, really easy software to use. Um, or something which I thought I will mention. Yeah, the the academic year. So you can change the academic year start date. Um, when you first start, it will ask you to enter your school name and then the academic year start date. Uh, it's in in there. So really easy software. Um, again, I said if we if I can find the right website, if you go on to SLS, SLS has got on their website. The new version here, and you can buy the chemicals on their own, and it's £145 only for the full site license, and it's one off payment. It's not a subscription, you buy the software, you own the software. Then we <clears throat> have the equipment database, which I think I may have five minutes to show you that. Then we you can buy both, and we do a starter pack where you can buy a barcode scanner and some labels to, to make it easy for you. Now, I talked about barcodes, and I'm going to switch, I'm going to try now, sorry, I'm going to try and switch cameras now. How do I do this now? It worked well, during the practice, I'm sure it'll be fine. <laughs> it did, it did. And now I can't see my, um, um, let me minimize the, no, um, I think I need to stop the share to switch cameras, to be honest. So this is where we are. And I'm going to stop sharing. Oh, no, I can. Can I do it from no? I'm going to stop. Yes, cameras, here we are. No, that turns it off. Right, I'm going to stop share for a sec. And then I'm going to go camera. And then I'm going to switch to the view camera. And now you can see the label prints. I'm sure you can all see them. Yes. Some label, yeah. Yeah. I've got some label printers, and our software link with this brother. Well, they don't have to be a brother. They link with the majority of label printers to produce your own barcodes. Really easy. And I'm going to show you in a sec how we do that. But I just want you now these label printers. As you can see, for some of the uh, labels, you can print your own barcodes, like what we have there. But you can use them for everyday use, uh, kind of making labels like this one. Two more hydrochloric acid, or some of the one I used last night, high voltage unit for EFT. And there are two different types of these label printers. This one here is the paper based. This one is the laminated. It's like the old dyno, basically, where you have laminal tapes and which they're lovely and permanent. I tend to, you know, uh, label all my chemical bottles 
that I use for every day, my two more uh, acids that I use, or you know, my uh, stains and things like that. Fantastic. You can level your cupboards and all kinds of things, your drawers, your trays, and they are permanent. That one is um, it's uh, more you can use for every day, so you can print labels and put on beakers and test tubes and all kinds of things. So, and uh, bulk of scan I've been using, I'm using a little wireless one, but the one we supply is just a standard um, uh, USB um, uh, bulk of scanner. Uh, so I'm going to stop this share now. And now I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to switch camera. I'm going to go back to my laptop camera. Yes, and you got me there. So we're going to share my screen again, which I'm here. And now I'm going to open this software, which I'm sure you see these. This is the software that come with these label printers, free software. And you can link with our software. And you can produce your own barcodes. And you, if you can see how the barcode changes, so I can select uh, one glorobutane, and I go print, and that's popping out of that. It will pop out of the, um, if I switch it on, because it's timed out. On that one. If I go print, it will come out of the label printer. Um, but you create your label. The, the, what's amazing about this? is that you create the label once and next time you open the software and this is the label i just print it just like that i see it as that so you create the label you save the label next time you go file open open the label and it remembers the link to here so you can go right today i just received um you know uh alanine almond oil or whatever, and you click print, they will print all those, and you put them down on your bottom. So to make it easy for the first, because this is linked to the our database, what I was saying earlier, for the first time you want to enter a chemical in our database, when we're here, I said you, do, you can go in here, search for silver nitrate, which is 543, that we said before, and then you enter all the information, you put the uh, the number on the bottle. If you are using, if you want to print barcodes, you come into the software here, you can search again for silver nitrate, or search using the, uh, uh, so find max, silver nitrate, and is there, I can print the label and you can see the stock number is like the same as this one, 543, print it. Then you come in here and scan it. And that's so easy to create labels because you create your barcode label just once and you save it and remember that. Fantastic label printers. Okay, we got a few more minutes and I'm just going to show you very, I'm going to, Close the chemicals. And I'm going to briefly open the equipment. I'm just going to spend two minutes um, to explain the equipment database. The equipment database is a blank database. It comes with one record. This one is an example to show you what you can do. Basically, again, we give each I, uh, item an ID, stock number, or just write the number on the item. It's up to you the name, make, model, serial number, but the more information you put in there, the more useful the database it becomes because, you know, um, if you put a value, you have a report where it gives you the total value, lots and lots of information. This is Mace Electrical, tick, tick the box that is Mace Electrical, right? And then we have a report that will print the Mace Electrical. If it's, if you do your own test, you can use this and, and put in when you did your last, uh, your last test. So again, data should view uh, 
reports. Again, this is the advantage of our software. All equipment report, it will give you a list of all your equipment, where it's stored. And the image is so great, isn't it? Because you know all this weird and, you know, some old weird physics equipment that we have, what do they look like? So you can have them there. Report again, all equipment by location. You know, it's in 217. What have I got? I've got two items in 217. There they are. Um, again, what about equipment by item? Now, how many microscopes do you have? That will give you a list of all your microscopes. Fantastic. We just had our service and we got 250 microscopes. So it was great to print the list and tick them off as they were serviced. My area of use, because this, well, having said, this equipment database, you have noticed that it's not just for science. The um, area of use, it could be any part of the school. So these can be <coughs> used by any department in the school. The reason we done that is that very often people says, oh, we haven't got the budget. Well, just say to them, it can be used by anyone in the school. Um, IT people use the art, science, engineering, uh, everyone in the school or college can use it. Then we have uh, Equipment value report, which I mentioned before, it gives you the total value. If the insurance wants to know what's the value of your uh, stock is there, mains electrical, um, or there. Now, I'm aware that we are, you know, um, also we have, if you've got annual stock check, you can see all the areas and the status, the ones that have been checked or unchecked items, it gives you the list. And this, is quite, you can do the stock take. Uh, just tick when you do the stock take, but this version is unbelievable because if you go to this rabbit stock take, I can go around. If I use a, a scanner, I can go around the room. All you need to do is scan the barcode and automatically updates um, the date here. So you, you, and it gives you a report that you've done all the. Uh, the uh, the stock take really <clears throat> up to date with all the information on loan for example if it's folded tick this box and it says this item is folded since today if you so many times i learn equipment and i forget and i start looking for it well if you're into another school or another department this one was learned it's gone to lab expert it, it's in yellow when it comes back delete it it's gone back to, to work. Hyperlink again, um, that goes onto the IPC website where the power supply is. Lots and lots of information. Right, it's now 3.17, and I think that's um, the time we start to finish, Gary. So I'm there. So the last yes. thing I wanted to, to say is that <coughs> I'm happy to do one-to-one -one, uh, live um, Teams or Zoom meeting with anyone if you wants to have a you know a demo of uh, their own demo or their Teams demo of the software to see what they like is something we're happy to do for 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 everyone. A couple of questions. I didn't want to disturb you during your um, demonstration because I know you was in your flow, but there was a few questions coming in. Most I think you answered during the demonstration. Um, if someone has your stock control system already, can they update to get the new version? Is it simple? Yes, or... 6495 yeah. mm -hmm. um, uh, for, for the latest upgrade for both the chemicals and equipment. And I will transfer all your data into the new version. So when you receive the new version, all your records will be there. Fortunately, that's only available direct from LabExpert. OK, and if someone has an Excel spreadsheet with their current you know, chemical stock list, can that be imported? It can, but I wouldn't recommend it because you will lose all the hazard information, all the, um, all the links which I took time to put in there. Because remember, that, uh, my database comes with 130 chemicals. 
which has sphere will be the majority of the parameters on that Excel spreadsheet. So it will be easier just to sort of go through your Excel spreadsheet and update ours. Yeah, I mean, uh, so I was asked the question, how long would you say it would take up to set up for, say, a small five lab department? And uh, I know the initial setup for this does take a bit of time, but if you like to be organised and stay organised, spend a lot of time at the start and then you're organised from Absolutely. there on. Absolutely. You do yeah. once. You do okay. once. It will take, it's very difficult to say, depends how much time you've got continuous time. It may take, a good, you know, a day, a couple of days, it depends on the size of your store, how it's laid out at the moment. You know, if you're well organized and you're, you've got the label printer and you're just printing all the labels from the start and then sticking a the label on and put two people can do it in a day or two. Okay. And um, does the software meet health and safety regulations? And that's what I, when the borough comes and checks, if you have, have a COSH form, can, that, can this replace that? Well, we got a link to the, um, to to the clear to the clear pass code and there is a separate link that you can copy and paste your msds or the safety data sheet if you wish to um i'm just trying to read new ones now um the starter pack yes it includes both the scanner and the printer i believe no um, not the one on you side that's something that i'd love expert that right okay so if you um, wanted to go start Started pack with the uh, scanners and label printers. Please come direct to me. The starter pack that is on the SLS website. It's a small starter pack that includes uh, the chemicals, the equipment, the barcode scanner, and two sets of labels, pre-printed labels, where you get one barcode of each number and then you can stick it on. That's for small schools that are there to, to get them started. Um, when you print the entire stock list, does it also give you the comments if you made comments next to them? Uh, no, but you can create your own report if you wanted to to create a report with comments. Okay. Uh, Yep, lots of people asking for your presentation. They've had a really great time. We've had people yeah. gradually dropping off since about five past three, but I imagine people banged on the prep room door or the school bell went and, and duty calls. Yeah, it's totally sort of understandable, of course. It is. I mean, we, we did expect that. So, yes, the recording will be made available. Um, I suppose I'll update from the old version. Yes, we've answered that question. You can update the old version for about £65 or just under that you said, so, didn't yeah. you? Yeah. Yeah. So you can upgrade the upgrades direct from Lab Experts. Uh, but you can buy the software from SLS if you if you want. Just go to the SLS, uh, put Lab Expert in the search, and they will come up. Um, if you want to the label printers, I can supply label printers, or you can go onto our website and choose one of the starter packs, or give me a call and I can do you what's um, best for your school. You know, one of the starter packs that I have there may not be what you want. You say, you know, I might want an extra scanners or two prints of different type. Call something, us. something else which a lot of people are quite interested in is, can they see how the Excel sheet export looks? Yeah, um, uh, yeah, and then why not? Share the screen, go on to, um, right, that's the, uh, close that, so I need to select webinar. So if I go to reports, so I'll go to the old chemicals report and then print and export, export to Excel and uh, browse. I'm going to put it onto my desktop. SLS will be not formal uh, for my report or chemicals. Save it. Uh, OK. Done. Let's minimize all that. Now that report is here. It's an Excel spreadsheet. If I can put it in there, just minimize the stock number. So I don't know why it changes the highlight. It doesn't like. So let me just change that to black so you can see. There they are. So yeah, stock number, location one, all the information is there. So that's for. So 
No, so that's, that looks very clear and easy to me. That does. Yeah, it's, yeah. Okay, so um, I'm, like I said, I'm sure I've missed a few questions here and there, but um, we've got lots of thank yous. Everyone's very happy today, Chris. So thanks a lot for delivering that content for us. Um, if anyone has any more questions, say after today, um, just please contact your area manager. I'll make sure everyone gets an email. I think half term is next week, but you'll probably get the email during half term. I'll try and include Chris's presentation as a PDF, a link to the recording on YouTube, and um, a link to his lab expert software as well and purchasing it through our website. Um, I know a few people have bought it and I have to say Chris is really good with giving you support. So if you buy it and you have questions or you want a demonstration, I mean, you can contact Chris directly and he'll, he'll go through this with you on a on a one to one basis, which uh, is, is really valuable to have when, you, when you're doing something like this. Well, uh, I just want to say thank you for everyone that attended today and uh, to Gary and his team for putting this uh, together. Uh, we discussed it some some time ago and we said yeah that's a fantastic idea and i think in the number of people that we had today it was amazing thank you all and as gary said <clears throat> uh do come to me you know i'm a technician myself uh i can give advice on some of the chemical storage not just on our software but our software we can customize soft the software if we, you know a number of people they say oh i don't like that report can you do another report i can help people do their own reports because one of the advantages of our software is not locked down in fact because it's based on microsoft access if you know how to program <coughs> excuse me i'm losing my voice if we if you know how to program with microsoft microsoft access you can actually customize it yourself but I have many people customize their avenue reports. No problem. I say so uh, thank you very much. So I'll, I'll stop.